Welcome back to our IB Biology video series. This is the first video in IB Biology Topic 7, Nucleic Acids, where we will be looking at DNA, DNA replication, and biotechnology. Before diving into this video, make sure you have watched the fourth video in our IB Biology Topic 2 video series, which introduced the foundations of nucleic acids. In this video, we discuss the work of both Franklin and Wilkins and Watson and Crick to reveal the double helix structure of DNA, consisting of two anti-parallel strands of nucleotides linked by complementary base pairing. We contrasted this to the single-stranded structure of RNA and stated that both form the genes for an organism. However, for IB biology higher level, you must learn a little more detail on the work of Franklin and Wilkins. You should know that for their observed crossed pattern, the cross indicated a helix shape, the angle of the cross showed the angle of the helix, the horizontal bars were 3.4 nanometers away from each other, and the distance between the middle and top of the diffraction pattern meant that DNA had a repeating structure. You must also familiarize yourself with the work of Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. Their work proved that DNA not protein, makes up genes within an organism. They did this by taking viruses known as T2 bacteriophages, which are composed of a protein coat with a capsid head containing DNA. These were known to inject their genes inside cells. They then cultured these viruses in radioactive sulfur and radioactive phosphorus so that the sulfur would integrate into the protein and phosphorus into the DNA. They then exposed E. coli to these viruses so that they would insert their genetic information into the E. coli. They then agitated and centrifuged the resulting solution to separate the bacteria from the viruses and tested both for radioactivity with a Geiger counter. When centrifuging the solution, the bacteria form a solid pellet at the bottom of the test tube, whereas the components in the extracellular matrix remain suspended in the fluid supernatant. They found that the sulfur was mostly radioactive in the supernatant, and that the phosphorus was mostly radioactive in the solid pellet. Since phosphorus is found in DNA, they therefore proved that the viral DNA was inserted into the bacterial cells, and thus genetic information must be made of DNA. But why is some sulfur present in the pellet, and some phosphorus present in the supernatant? Well, Agitation of the solution shakes off many of the protein coats into the supernatant, but some may remain attached to bacteria and end up in the pellet. Additionally, some viruses may not inject their DNA into the bacteria, meaning that some phosphorus never enters the bacteria and remains in the supernatant. So, you now know the evidence for DNA's function alongside the evidence for its structure. However, at higher level, you also need to learn a little more detail on both the microscopic and macroscopic organization of DNA. Let's look at this now. On a macromolecular level, DNA forms a double helix and is joined by complementary bases. For the higher level syllabus, you need to be aware that the four nitrogenous bases within DNA are slightly different in size. We can therefore group them into two groups, purines and pyrimidines. Purines are larger, and are adenine and guanine. Pyrimidines are smaller, and are thymine and cytosine. Uracil in RNA is also a pyrimidine. A useful trick to remember this is that pyrimidines has the letter Y in its name, as do the nitrogenous bases within its group. Easy. On a macromolecular level, you must appreciate that eukaryotic DNA is not found as long strands but instead wrapped around eight protein spheres, each known as a histone, arranged into a cube. To stop it unravelling, there is a further rod histone, which clamps the DNA in position. This combined structure is referred to as a nucleosome, and it allows DNA to supercoil. We have often referred to prokaryotic DNA as non-protein associated, i.e. naked. And with this context, you can hopefully now appreciate this means it does not wrap around histones. With your knowledge of DNA complete, we can now expand on the process of DNA replication, as introduced in topic 2 of our IB Biology video series. 
In this video series, we discussed how DNA replication is carried out by several key enzymes. For the higher level IB biology syllabus, you need to know much more detail on the process. Let's go through it. DNA gyrase, a topoisomerase, unwinds the DNA. DNA helicase then separates the DNA strands by breaking hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs. Then, single-stranded binding proteins can keep the strands separated. The existing strands are used as templates, as DNA primase lays down RNA primer. You can think of this like scaffolding. DNA polymerase 3 then adds free nucleotides, known as nucleotide triphosphates, to the RNA primer, using complementary base pairing, in a 5' to 3' direction i.e. it adds them to the 3' end of the RNA primer. In one strand, the 3' end is constantly exposed, so DNA polymerase 3 can work continuously. This is known as the leading strand, and it produces a single, long strand of nitrogenous bases. In the other strand, the 3' end is not consistently exposed, so DNA polymerase 3 works backwards in short segments. This is known as the lagging strand, and it produces multiple short strands of nitrogenous bases, known as Okazaki fragments. In both strands, DNA polymerase 1 then replaces the RNA primer with DNA. On the lagging strand, DNA ligase then joins the Okazaki fragments together to form a single continuous strand. This results in the formation of two complete DNA strands, each containing one template strand hence the term semi-conservative. By far the most common eight marker in the exam is to describe the process of DNA replication. So let's talk through a model answer now. You've now reached the end of the preview for this IB Science video. If you want to check out the full video, head over to our website and select a membership plan today.